It's the early 17th century, a time when the Native American tribes are still living undisturbed by other cultures, experiencing life to the fullest, when English colonists guided by Captain Newport arrive on their land. John Smith, one of the main characters, is imprisoned by the captain at the time. He is about to be hanged for mutiny when Newport makes his way towards the platform and spares him, threatening him with death if any other mutinous behavior ever occurs from him again. After that, rebellious John walks around the forests as if he is experiencing this kind of connection for the first time, while after careful consideration, Captain Newport decides that this place is perfect and starts settling here. He deliberately warns his men not to disturb the natives, since they may trade with them in the future. In the following scene, they first come into contact with them. The natives cautiously yet reactively approach them, interested like a flock of deer. The savages, as John wrongly calls them in his writings, start visiting them often, and they create a good-hearted relationship. In the meantime, the newcomers start building a fort, chopping down trees, and acting in accordance with Western culture, which is so weird and unknown to the natives. This sparks mistrust in them, however, they maintain a peaceful relationship. John frequently walks in a meadow. One time he sees the face of a young girl raised from the high grass. The girl looks at him mesmerized, her vision completely locked on John, until her brother calls her and they walk away. This dreamlike vision of a young woman is engraved in John's memory. Meanwhile, the relationship between two people changes after two natives are captured, and one is shot inside the fort for stealing. This causes everything to go upside down, however, Newport can't turn the whole group back now because of the lack of resources. He says the natives told him of a mighty king who lives up the river. Newport, despite the cynical opposition from Wingfield, gives the job of an envoy to Captain John Smith, the only professional soldier there, telling him that he should use this opportunity to regain his reputation. Newport decides to go back alone to bring supplies from England, and a group of Englishmen guided by John, carrying two captives, start going up the river to meet with the supposedly great king and trade with him. John, who has a lot of time while traveling, thinks of the potential outcome of this journey, the outcome that would bring purity, a fresh beginning, equality, and everything that Western culture lacks. At one point, they have to continue the road on ground. The group arrives in the abandoned camp of the naturals, scared and without hope. Once the suggestion of going back is made, one of the natives runs away. In the following scene, we see one natural and three Western men, including John, in a wooden canoe, making their way through the sublime landscape. Once the river gets too thin, they get out of the canoe, armed and cautious, trying to walk stealthily, even though John is wearing full armor. Walking through high grass, John hears a strange voice and loses his captive, staying all alone. He gets lost, wandering in the forest, reactive to all sounds. Suddenly, an arrow comes John's way and is reflected by his armor. He swiftly gets his weapon, however, the natives are coming one by one from all directions. He is captured by the naturals, who are captivated by his armor and look, examining him and eventually deciding that he is special. They bring him back to their village and drag him to their chieftain. John stands in front of him in a den full of natives who examine his weapons, speak in a language unknown to him, and behave atypically. The whole room is shaking. Eventually, after some consideration, the chieftain starts talking to John, pointing to the sky, thinking that it's where he is from. John denies it, saying hopelessly that he is from England, and after some silence and mumbling, he begins working on his task. John goes forward, getting gunpowder from his pocket, and throws some into the fire, causing a small explosion. He does this all in order to impress the natives, and he succeeds, however, everything backfires on him when, after consideration, the shamans decide that he's a bad omen rather than someone with whom they can trade. Everything gets upside down in the blink of an eye. He is about to get killed, swarmed by the natives, all goes black for a second. However, a girl that he once saw standing in the grass throws herself upon him and saves his life, bargaining with the chieftain, her father, as if she were bargaining with death to spare his life. The chieftain, along with some other natives, has a small conversation and eventually decides that he shall live, join the tribe, and teach Pocahontas, the girl who saved his life, about his land beyond the waves. However, if his people get greedy, they shall exile them from their land. And so, John is now with the natives, in a culture that is so strange to him. Despite that, he doesn't seem to be feeling lonely at all. People approach him, trying to connect with him. And weirdly, John walks beneath the trees as if it were his home. Pocahontas teaches him her language, expressing the words with gestures and moving candidly. They connect on a level that doesn't require language, they start developing a bond that lies beyond words. John is fascinated by all of them, but he's especially drawn to this girl, the favorite child of the chieftain, who grows brighter than the sun itself in John's eyes. As time goes by, he likes the tribe even more and spends time with the natives as if he were one of them. It almost seems like he's coming out of his shell, surrounded by loving and free-spirited people who don't know jealousy, greed, possession, lying, envy, etc. Like souls that Westerners only see in their dreams. But one day, his father, the chieftain, warns Pocahontas that she must always put her people first, 
and that this man, an outsider, is not one of them. Meanwhile, John feels changed, free, and away from his pirate-like life. One evening, he saves a kid from drowning, and suddenly, the feeling that he has the power to grant life and health to others strikes him. His relationship with Pocahontas also changes. It's raining on the beach, Pocahontas is coming out of the lake, and once she approaches John, the latter looks at her as if she were a cosmic miracle, or a treasure of unreachable land. He lowers his head, considering something, and starts embracing Pocahontas, who takes a feather from her hair and gives it to him. They get closer than they've ever been, and so continues the life of simplicity and fulfillment for John. As he says, love is all that's real, all that's real visits him, and he receives it in its fullest. Meanwhile, Pocahontas, a girl who's used to distributing her light and warmth amongst everyone, now feels like she belongs to only one, a man who seems like a god to her, and life starts to make sense only by his side. There is only one person she shares her spirit with now, and this weird turn of events makes her feel like she finally exists as an individual, as someone who belongs only to herself and one other person, John. However, paradise changes when the chieftain's chiefs tell him that John shall die, since he knows each of their strengths and weaknesses. However, Pocahontas convinces her father that he is a good man, and eventually, the chieftain decides to free him, sending him away on the condition that he and his men leave when spring comes. And so, the natives bring him back to the settlement, which looks more developed now. His men lead him inside the wooden fence into the muddy yard surrounded by crudely built buildings, a place so unlike the natural's village. He walks around slowly, with the feather that once belonged to Pocahontas in his hair, and meets a group Group of unruly kids who tell him the news. Captain Radcliffe has gone to England, the people are starving here, and the whole settlement is now full of theft, sickness, and gambling. No one is in charge. At one point, they are joined by Wingfield, who makes the children go away and tells John bitterly of the suffering that has been happening here while he was enjoying himself somewhere else instead of carrying out his task. As it turns out, Wingfield is now the president, and John Smith doesn't have the title of a captain anymore. Wingfield also tells him that there has been a trial against him while he was away. However, there's no unity in the settlement. People start gathering around, and Mr. Argall is the first to tell John about Wingfield's crimes and felonies. As it turns out, Woodson, and his real name, is the name of a man who was disgraced in England. Hearing this, Woodson demands that they are all captured, however, the ones that try to do so seem weak and powerless. Seeing this, Woodson gets his gun and points at John, stating that he is going to kill him now in the name of the king. However, before he does so, Mr. Argall shoots him, killing him at once. And so, the people who are divided and bitter decide that it's Captain John who should lead them now. In the fall of 1608, a stream of sudden sorrow hit John. He loves someone he can't love, and this contradiction makes him think that all of it was a dream. Meanwhile, the natives start coming back to the settlement. One man enters the door and, surrounded by the modern people, is fascinated by their cannons and weapons, fences, and armors. John seems to be regretting his actions, making Pocahontas fall in love with him while his people starve for gold. Greed is winning over their souls, even though boiled leather is the only thing that they have to eat. John sees this contrast between people of two cultures even more intensely when cannibalism begins to take root inside the fort. Now there are only 38 of them left. In the following scene, the winter starts and there is nothing to eat. The suffering is bringing John down and making him question his intentions toward Pocahontas, the natives, and even his men. He doesn't know why he's here anymore. The settlement is doomed to die before Captain Newport comes from England with food. But one morning, they suddenly see a full tribe walking towards their fort, bringing food to end their suffering. Pocahontas is among them. Once the Englishmen open the doors, Pocahontas starts looking around to see John, finds him, and slowly goes towards him, smiling, locking her gaze on him while the people around her lose their minds from the happiness that this miracle has brought upon them. They finally meet again, however, John looks different now, and after Pocahontas asks why he didn't come for her, he says that there is nothing else Pocahontas should do for them, and that she should take care of herself, and not trust him, because she doesn't know who he is. This hurts Pocahontas, and she leaves almost grudgingly as the people kneel before her, their savior. However, John knows what his intentions are by now, he loves her, and the best thing that he can do for her is to stay away from her, since he's a polluted soul. While Pocahontas is as pure as the driven snow, from a culture that is like an unpolished diamond. He knows that they'll contaminate the natives if they don't separate. In the meantime, Pocahontas is lost, not knowing who it is that she loves. Flashing forward, the spring comes, and John is loading a boat with a few other men to trade with the Native Americans. They start going up the river, while a thought enters John's mind that one must only cling to good things in life. They arrive at the village shores, and John enters. One of the chiefs has some trading materials on the ground and speaks to John in his own language. As his heart rate rises, he can't help but think of Pocahontas. In the next scene, they encounter one another once more on a meadow surrounded by trees. This time they can speak with words but choose not to. They just embrace each other quietly, and their relationship continues from where it ended a few months ago. John remembers what love feels like. However, it's spring, and the Englishman must start to think about leaving. John proposes that she go to England with him, and she agrees, 
saying that being with him is all she needs. John and his men go back empty-handed, and while on the way, John thinks of the fact that life is only real with her. In the forest, he can lose his name, get away from the cities, and start his life all over again somewhere in the wild. Back in the village, he suggests to his people that they go west or south from here to find better soil, and a more suitable land to inhabit. However, they go nowhere. In the following scene, a small group of Native Americans come across some Englishmen, concluding that they are not intending to leave. When the chieftain hears this, Pocahontas is his first suspect. He asks her who gave them seat, and Pocahontas doesn't say anything. She runs away and leaves the chieftain enraged. The whole village prepares to fight, while Pocahontas runs into the forest. That night, she arrives at the door of the fort in secret. She tells John to come away, that her people are coming, and that he should make peace with them. But John knows that there is no place that they can go. He tells Pocahontas hastily that she should stay with him in the fort since her people will soon find out about her visit. But Pocahontas runs away into the darkness, wandering around the chopped down forest till the morning. In the following scene, the natives arrive and the battle starts. Cannons fire from the fort, and more organized soldiers fight against the raw force of the natives. John chooses not to get involved in a fight yet, but once the natives get the upper hand, he understands that a decision must be made. Finally, he joins his people in fighting, killing dozens of Native Americans, while Pocahontas still wanders around the field, desperate and crying. Situations change on the battlefield. When Pocahontas comes across his brother, dying from the wounds, she kneels down and grieves him heartbreakingly, however, she is soon captured by her people. Meanwhile, the battle is stopped for a moment on the field. They are trying to end the battle without any more blood, but to no avail. A shot is fired, and this enraged the natives. Eventually, the Englishmen are forced to retreat back into their fort. Many die on both sides as the naturals climb the fences and continue fighting inside. In the meantime, Pocahontas is brought to her village. She is standing in front of her father, who knows that she gave crops to the Englishmen. But, as he says, he is too old to give her away to die, so he decides to exile her from the tribe. She is no longer his daughter, and this is the last time they shall speak, the last time she has a chance to walk beneath these woods. Meanwhile, the naturals are outside the fort, destroying the crops, while the colonialists are clumsily shooting at them from a distance. In the evening, the natives put a dead dog in their well poisoning their water, and since the Englishmen are stuck inside their fort, starvation and thirst hit them one more time. The scarce population, suffering from a hard life, turns against John. One time, a man from the fort came out and saw Pocahontas in a camp near the settlement. After that, along with Argall, he approaches John and proposes the idea that will change the situation in his mind. He says that the rebel king of that tribe is proposing to sell her to them. With her inside the fort, the emperor won't dare to attack them. However, John knows what this hive of contempt will do to Pocahontas, and besides, she has done enough for Virginia. So John refuses to hold her captive, and this sparks a huge resistance. Argall mocks him, saying that there are other, more personal reasons behind his decision, and John strikes him for this mutiny. However, the people are against him, and Argall becomes president banishing John, the traitor of his men, from the colony. He is whipped, hearing the voice of Pocahontas. Both lovers were banished from their societies for their love. Argall puts John in hard labor and tortures him every night. Going forward, Argall and a group of colonists capture Pocahontas from the rebel king and bring her back to Virginia, which is still in an open conflict. While on the way, Pocahontas thinks that this boat is from John. Once they arrive, Argall tells her that John is no longer president. She approaches him, looking around to see him, but this time he's nowhere to be found. Pocahontas enters the gates, looking frightened, and the entire fort quickly surrounds her like a cage. They see her in her new house, treating her like a princess, but her name is not the source of her power, it's nature, and everything here seems artificial. Flashing forward, the ships arrive from England, firing cannons and forcing the natives towards peace. In the following scene, Pocahontas meets John once more. Their encounter is quiet until he tries to justify his actions, turning his head away, disappointed in how everything turned out. However, when Pocahontas gets near him, making him feel that everything's alright, and embracing each other, they remind each other of the time they had in the forest. In the following scene, Captain Newport walks up to John and tells him that the king wants him to return to England in order to start an exhibition on his own. The king has great hopes for him, and while he pitches this idea to John, a lady visits Pocahontas, who doesn't say her name anymore. The lady grooms her and dresses her like a European. She feels restricted in her new clothes, however, despite everything she's got with John, and it's enough. But John suffers, he knows he must make a heartbreaking decision. Eventually, he tells one of the citizens to wait for two months and then tell her that he's dead. As John leaves to go to England, away from his love, Pocahontas learns about this. It means death for her. She grieves terribly, while only a couple of citizens are trying to comfort her clumsily. Her sorrow is too great, and finally, she is all alone here, a daughter of Earth who must be free, amongst colonialists that don't know a thing about communal grief. Time passes, and when she starts to get better, a man tells her that John is dead, drowned in the sea. This reignites her sorrow, making her suffer even more. 
However, this time she cries less and goes around the fort aimlessly, knowing that her will to live is gone after John. Meanwhile, the colonialists start conflict once more against the natives, burning their village and leaving them homeless. Pocahontas still wanders around grudgingly, looking at living things hopelessly, however, she still tries to reconnect with them, and this process brings tears to her eyes, which is a sign that she is slowly coming to life. As time goes on, John Ralph, a widower who owns a tobacco plantation nearby, falls in love with Pocahontas. One day he approaches her, proposing to spend an afternoon together. Back in her home, a lady advises Pocahontas to not bow to the misfortunes of life, but to keep on reaching towards the light as trees and all living things do. In the following scene, Ralph visits her and teaches her some things, her cluelessness sparks a sense of guardianship in him, and soon he gets wound up in feelings towards her. He seems like a kind and good man. Pocahontas soon gets baptized, changes her name to Rebecca, and leaves the fort, going away to work on Ralph's plantation. There, she seems happier and calmer, but she grows quieter day by day. Despite this, however, they still manage to connect, and Pocahontas being alive again feels better, while filling the emptiness inside Ralph's heart. After a while, Ralph proposes to her, telling her that she should forget her past and start over. Pocahontas is conflicted, as if this will be a betrayal of John. However, she likes the idea of starting over, but she isn't as strong to make this decision, so she tells him that she is willing to do it if this is what he wants. She must be happy because this is the only feeling that is widely accepted in Western society, but John accepts her completely and says that she will love her someday. In the following scene, Newport makes John write a letter to the government and state that everything but love is the reason for his decision. He does it since he truly loves her, and so they are wed. As the seasons change, she gets accustomed to being a wife. Although Pocahontas fails to fall in love with Ralph, she understands that he is a shelter for her, a man who is slowly breathing life and happiness into her soul. Time goes on, and Pocahontas becomes a mother, which brings even more meaning to her life. One day, sudden news comes. Ralph and Rebecca are invited to England by the king and queen for a royal audience. In spring 1614, Pocahontas overhears a rumor that John is alive and well, getting back to London after poking around in the north. This snake in the Eden Garden changes everything for her. Later that day, she informs Ralph that she will not be attending because she is married to John Smith, who is still alive. John doesn't get angry, he understands that there is something that he'll never understand about Pocahontas. He believes that someday she'll forget about John Smith, so he decides to endure it. In the following scene, they board the ship and go to London. There are some natives there too, sent by Pocahontas' father. Once they arrive, a modern city with all its magnificence fascinates Pocahontas and other Native Americans. As they make their way into the city, the citizens of London are also fascinated by these strange newcomers. Once they arrive, the fanciness of the audience is too much for her, however, she manages to walk inside the room with grace. The king holds her hand and shows her around the room. Pocahontas is dazzled and troubled by the beauty of the castle, filled with alive animals in cages. After the audience, Pocahontas' uncle is in the garden. The tamed nature is so strange and peculiar for him. Pocahontas comes out too and feels the same. She approaches him, and in a small conversation, she shares how her mistakes brought her here, into the new world. She asks him and her people for forgiveness and says that she's still the daughter of her father. Uncle doesn't say anything to this and walks away in cold silence. Meanwhile, Ralph is anxious, he tells Newport that his marriage is built upon the ignorance of Pocahontas. He knows that he will never be able to take John Smith's place in her heart and decides not to do anything against her will. She now must make a decision. John Smith arrives as the husband and wife discuss their circumstances. Ralph knows that she's still in love with him. He realizes that he can't and shouldn't make her fall in love with him. He knows that for her self-respect, he must give her the opportunity to decide on her own, to go and talk with him. So Ralph tells Pocahontas to go down to meet him in order to take the reins of her to her own hands. This assures Pocahontas that he is the man she thought he was, and more. After that, she comes out of the castle to meet John Smith. Afraid to see the love of her life, she walks up to him slowly. They go around the garden, and John starts speaking first. He says that he thinks of Pocahontas a lot. He expresses that he's happy for how her life turned out after he left. He looks as if it was exactly his intention, and we understand that only the fact that he left made it possible for Pocahontas to have a life like this at the end. However, Pocahontas stays silent, and as they reach a pond, she asks him whether he found his indies or not. John says that he may have passed them. These words engrave a smile on Pocahontas' face. Lastly, after some time, John tells her that everything that's happened in America is like a dream for him. Pocahontas nods and smiles and walks away as John looks at her like a treasure he lost, like an indies, he sailed past. Finally, Pocahontas approaches Ralph from behind, takes his arm, and looks at him, making it evident that her decision is made. Now that she has found her way out of John Smith's maze, Pocahontas knows she can be happy and she can love another. Now she knows where Mother Nature is. She lives happily with her family, but after a while, she falls ill and passes away, gently reminding Ralph that all, even the purest, must die.